Welcome to SelfDiscoveryWisdom.com, formerly known as Self Discovery Media. On these podcasts, you're going to hear people who speak from the heart. They've taken the journey in life. Many things have happened to them, but they've changed it to happening for them. And in their strength, their courage, they've discovered their abilities and their wisdom, and they are now sharing it here with you. Do enjoy each show. We bring it to you with love and knowing that it's going to help you on your journey of life. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome back to our Forgotten Children book series and talking to one of our wonderful authors, Buddy Thornton. And he put a very compelling chapter in the book. Um, He's actually got the book already. I'm in Canada. It takes longer for us to get the book. Show the book here, Buddy, for all those that are watching. There is our book, our Forgotten Children book, and I'm very, very proud, very proud of all the people that contributed to it, and and Buddy contributed on parenting, and, you know, he was. we were just saying, you know, when do you stop being a parent, and you never stop, it doesn't matter how old you are, how old they are, we are always looking from our perspective of wisdom and knowledge and experience of things that we can contribute, because we're seeing it from a different point of view, we're not in the everyday parenting. So as an observer, we see things differently and also coming from our own experience and just life experience itself. But when does a kid stop listening? <laughs> and, or should I say, when does a kid start listening? Hey, buddy. <laughs> I think actually that the, the second question is more apropos. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I am a parenting expert and I do, I have spent decades trying to learn mainly because I'm a great grandfather and I I'm immersed in that world all the time. But you know, what amazes me isn't when do the kids listen or when do they not listen, but how much I have learned from them over the decades. Yeah. I learned certain lessons from my kids. I learned certain lessons from my grandkids. And today, you know, my wife is watching a four-year-old great grandson and I learned things about behavior that I may have missed three, four decades ago, because I wasn't aware of what I was looking for. Yes. And yet that's that's the key, though. What are we looking for? We're so busy, immersed in the moment to moment that we're not paying attention to what we're seeing. So we don't really know what to look for. Well, in my own special in my own specific book about parenting, I, I make a very bold claim that that the only job a parent has in the entire world is to deliver a fully functional adult to society Mm -hmm. and how you define that and how you work through that really is a unique journey for every parent. That's why, even though there were, according to my research, over 50,000 parenting books written in the last five years. Oh my God. (laughs) Not one is prescriptive. I mean, they try to be, you know, Oh, you gotta be like tiger mom. Oh, you gotta be this. Oh, you gotta be that. My, my answer is no. You need to co-create the space with them because they are the value component. If you think you're the value component as the parent, you have got the equation completely upside down. Yeah. Flip it. They are the value component. How do you make them optimize? How do you put them in an environment where they can optimize? Mm -hmm. And that's why I wrote my chapter about family, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. I believe that regardless of what kind of family you come from or that you work around, Everyone has an opportunity to get to the top of the tree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I want to go back a a little bit to what you just said about the value of children. We're so busy dictating what we want them to be, what we think they should be, and what society has dictated they should be, that we're not allowing them to be the gift they are. Every single one of us is born with a particular gift, a particular asset, and it's up to us to nurture that to let them explore all their options. We will always see a tendency in our children that they are uh, prone to certain things that they really, they go to, and they're going to try all different types of mediums along the way. Let us be the wind underneath their wings. Let's let them explore safely while they're under our wings. Let them explore safely. Let them, you know, experiment with life. But if we're going to be dictating all the time, no, you can't do this. And how many times does a child hear no before the age of five, right? More than they ever hear. Yes. (laughs) Right. And well, I'm going to tell you one of the black parents that I dealt with, she said, when you, when you look at the introspective and she wrote, she read a book about uh, children in disadvantaged uh, environments. 
And she said the one sentence that every child who's in a disadvantaged environment learns to hate as they grow up is the sentence, be quiet, go to bed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because they're being marginalized and they're being pigeonholed and they're really just in the way. Yes. Yes. The the problem isn't that I, I see society from a different lens. I think that because we, we want to protect our children so much that we start having irrational thoughts about what protection really is. Mm -hmm. Albert Einstein, a hundred years ago, said that if you want a child to grow appropriately, put them in a learning environment and let them loose. Yes. The Montessori Montessori and the Waldorf uh, experiment, (laughs) right? It's it's like, follow their lead. (laughs) Now, now, does that mean that sometimes they're going to miss a few of the components they need? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's why we're there to put in the boundaries and the lane markers and to keep them on track. But if we corral their Mm. innate curiosity, if we, if we stamp that out too young, they become a very disgruntled, very disenfranchised young adult who really has no direction other than whatever you told them. They become little affirmation apples that have to fall right underneath the tree. And then they go, Oh man, I want to do that. Is that going to be a good decision? And they're always looking behind themselves or above themselves to say, can you please tell me I have a permission? Yes. I don't want my children to have permission except from themselves. Yeah. Yes. You know, do I want to make sure they make good choices? You know what? I can do the best I can, but Mm -hmm. I am never going to be able to control that. Help them understand what a good choice is. Mm -hmm. And you'd be amazed at how quickly they make a whole series of great choices. It's amazing. It's, it's, you know, I was always teaching my kids, know your boundaries, right? You know, you, you want to take a leap off that mountain. How about you assess the, the, the risk? You know, you assess everything else before you do so. Is it a good idea? Always pause to ask yourself, is it a good idea? And if you push your boundaries and the price is paid, right? You know that you push your boundary, you've paid that price, you've got to accept that, whatever the consequence is. But listen to yourself beforehand because our gut is always speaking to us. Our spirit is always speaking to us and saying, uh-uh, I shouldn't do that. Case in point, my son skipped school one day, 13 year old, decided to go and swing on this hook above a ravine. And when he was on the hook, he said, no, I don't feel secure here and wanted to come off. And somebody said, but my girlfriend can do it. And so immediately ego stepped in. If he doesn't do it, you know, he's a failure. He did it. He lost his footing. He came down 25 feet embankment, landed up in the stream below. And when he woke up, his leg was snapped in half and behind him right? That was the consequence. And he knew it, right? And the consequences then he had to go through surgery and recovery and all all the other things that happened because of it. And that is something we need to teach our children and let them push those limits while they're under our wing. Uh, So we're there to help them pick themselves back up. What was your gut telling you? What have you learned from this? Will you listen next time? Will you gauge that because how do they know what their boundary is until they experiment and while they're under our wing let us nurture that i mean yes there's the common sense fear don't go and put your hand in the fire don't put it on the stove those are things we teach them when they're young because it's hot and they don't know consequences yet not in the same light right it's common sense but as they get older and they're pushing the envelope teach them to trust their own gut and their own instincts. Should I or shouldn't I? Is this right? Is this wrong? What kind of price am I going to pay and am I willing to pay it? And then you'll generally find they will think about things first before they go and make those choices. Well, I'm going to, exp- this is fairly well known. So you may know this one already, but I'm going to, this is one of the lessons I teach parents. So if you want to teach your children how to respect boundaries, co-create the boundaries with them. And the example I give is the bedtime. Mm-hmm. A lot of parents, they that is probably the number one thing they they avoid. They hate bedtime because they get a big fight from their kids. Yes. And if you approach it from a totally different direction, teach them the value of a good night's sleep mm-hmm. and then give them the opportunity to set their own bedtime, but then give them the consequence ahead of time. Mm-hmm. If you label the consequence, they know they're not going to be able to get away from the consequence. Mm-hmm. And uh, the way we did it was, I don't care what time you go to bed, but when I get up in the morning and I tell you it's time to get up and get ready for school, 
you will be taken to school, whether you're dressed or not, whether you're appropriate or not, you're going to school. <laughs> Pajamas <care>. and all. <laughs> and, and it only took a couple of bleary eyed mornings of, oh, this is horrible for them to understand that when we say that it's good to get a good seven, eight, nine hours of sleep, that it's appropriate. And mm -hmm. lo and behold, all of my adult children go to bed, nine, nine thirty, ten 10 o'clock. They don't stay up till one, two in the morning. They go to bed, they get up, they go to work the next day. And they never have a problem getting up because mm -hmm. we didn't browbeat them about bedtime. What we did was we taught them the value of a good night's sleep. And we explained to them the consequences early on. And now they're like, well, if I don't go to bed and I don't get up, I don't make a paycheck. Well, you know what? They got the message yes. somewhere. They got the message. Yes, exactly. What age do you start that though? Because we've, you know, my grandson is almost three, and they, they, their bedtime thing is is he plays with his cars and they read him a few books and then he's in bed, uh, yeah. and he's at you know at that stage of crying when mummy and daddy leave the room, right? Uh -huh. But no, we've had our downtime, you know, winding down. Um, because he always gets this burst of energy after supper before bedtime. So let him burst the energy and then wind him down. And then it's bed after a few books and it's the same routine. Uh, but he still pushes that envelope. So, you know, what age can you introduce uh, the consequences that they will get? Well, you know, there are very, very distinct dis uh, development phases that have been researched over the decades. Around age seven, children start to learn inductive reasoning which means, oh, well, if it applies to me, it must apply to everybody. And of mm. course, we know that's a fallacy. We know that's <laughs> wrong, but we need them to learn reasoning at some level. So that's where they start learning the reasoning. They don't start learning deductive reasoning until about age nine or 10. Mm. And the reason they don't do that is because they can't understand that they do have the ability to make their own choices, but they have to recognize where something is a social fit or not. Yeah. And so, you know, if... Uh, my dog Joe is a dog and their dog Charlie's a dog. Everyone named Joe and Charlie's named dog. That's intuitive thing. That's inductive thinking. That's wrong. But we do know that they are both dogs because we can see them. That's deductive reasoning. I see you. I know you're a dog. You're a dog. Mm -hmm. Can we recognize a dog when they're a tiny Chihuahua or a, or a Great Dane? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They're still a dog. Mm -hmm. That's deductive reasoning. We don't get abstract thinking until about age 12 or 13. So the best time to start co-creating and making choices is somewhere between deductive reasoning and abstract thinking. Around age 10 or so, the way we handle a toddler world mm -hmm. is we explain the benefit of wear and tear. A child will go 90 to nothing because they have no filter and they have no, no breaks, <laughs> yes. but you can get them to the point where they're ready to go to sleep themselves. Usually for us, it's when we start reading the book by page three, they're snoring. Mm -hmm. So that we conquered it by simply understanding how do we know when their motor is turning a notch down? And so you just, I teach parents to learn the cues instead of browbeating the child and saying, hey, it's time for bed, it's time for bed, it's time for bed. Get them to be ready for bed. Get them to be physically and emotionally ready for bed. They'll climb into bed because they're tired and they want you to read to them because that's a comfort zone. But then they'll fall asleep because you are their, their, their protector. Blanket in other ways. <laughs> yeah. So, so to answer your question, it's it's a variable between ages three and about eight or nine. But by age ten, if you haven't started having reasoning and co-creation conversations with your child, you're going to be behind the curve. Mm -hmm. They only have three things they want. They want to know how to get around you. Mm -hmm. They want to know how they fit in the universe. And they want to know how to make friends. Yeah, Those are the only three things they want. Everything else fits in those buckets. How, they want to know how to get around you, get good grades in school. That keeps you off their back, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, everyone goes, oh, no, you got to teach them to be good in school. No, 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 you don't. Allow them to find a way to make sure you're not in conflict. And by doing that, hey, if you bring home A's and B's, we're not going to have fights. We're good. We're great. If you're struggling, if you don't come to me so I can help you, we're going to fight. But if you come to me and you got C's and I helped you, then we are going to co-create the solution. I don't want my children to feel like they can't come to me and no parent should. No. And yet no. most parents think, oh, no, I got to tell them this. I got to. No, no. Don't tell them. Ask them mm -hmm. and get them involved in the conversation. You can do this. You, If you just realize those three things, mm -hmm. they want to get around you at all costs. 
they want to find out where they fit in the universe and how to make friends. Those are the only three things they're interested in. And since your goal is only to make them a fully functional adult, wouldn't it be smart for you to teach them how to optimize all three of those things? Yeah. Yeah. Teach them how to get around you, but in a safe way, mm -hmm. in a predictable way, so that they actually are satisfying the need that you see so that they don't trigger you. And you teach them by doing that. You're teaching them how to work with other people. Yes. And it's great because they socialize so rapidly. And then all of a sudden, doesn't that trigger their ability to make more friends? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So everything kind of goes hand in hand. It's like this little mud ball. We put on the, the platter wheel and we make the mug, you know, and, and we're good. We throw it in the kiln and we go, wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. The results, right? When they actually see something that they've implemented come into a result, it's like, um, and then, of course, they get praise. Well done. Look what you've just created. And it's like, well, they want more of that, right? So it sets off of that cre whole creative source there. But again, a lot of parents feel, um, and, you know, this happens a lot with Asian children. My, child my children are half Asian. And a lot of Asian families, it's this, uh, you, you know, you've got to be a doctor. You've got to be a lawyer. You've, you've got to be this. You only can come home with A's or A pluses. And it's so much pressure on a child. And basically it's saying to a child, you are not worthy of anything unless you are a high performer. And if that child can't live up to that high performance, they feel less than. What's now what, you know, now that you've opened that door, what do you <laughs> think the negative connotation of that is? Here's the negative connotation. I'll lay it out so that the, the, the listeners can get this very flat line. We want every child, and I never have met any parent of a three or four year old who doesn't say, my child is exceptional. My child is way ahead of the curve. They all think that. At age six, globally, in every society around the world, children are about par mm -hmm. at age six because they're right on the cusp of getting inductive reasoning and they're starting through that developmental cycle. And because they're all equal at the age of six, if you put them on an expectation curve, browbeat them based on that they are still limited in their development because the first development cycle is pleasing their parents or, yes. or answering expectations mm -hmm. the second development phase is being able to establish your own in expectations and if you never are allowed to create your own expectations how can you develop into that part of your psych psychology we see this all the time when we see kids who are 30, 40 years old. And I use, I didn't notice, I didn't say adults. I said kids, 30 and 40. When they go, wow, was this the stupidest thing I ever did going through law school? Or wow, did I just waste eight years of my yeah. life because I hate being a doctor? Yes. I have a very good friend who's in his 60s. And he said the worst seven years I spent in my entire life was college and law school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He's I a marketing person that says, I did yeah. this to please the parents and I did not want to do it at all. And, and he's and he's an he is a world class marketer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the bottom line is, can you not find out what their passion is? Can you yes. not find out what their desires are? Yes. And then can you match them? Mm -hmm. Now, is there value in becoming an attorney or a doctor as long as it allows you to pay for your passion? If it's a passion mm -hmm. that won't make money, yes. there's no shame in that. No. But let's color it that. Let's call it that. Yes. If you do this, you'll make so much money and have a level of affluence to where you can do whatever you choose to do. And so that'll feed that little habit you got over there that you love. Mm -hmm. and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but be transparent about it. Yeah. The parent yeah. says, no, you know, if you're my mother fit in that mold, she said, I want you to be an attorney or a doctor. And, you know, I, I took until my late 60s to get a doctorate. So I guess I fulfilled her mission. But <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, she was wrong in trying to push me yes. into a very narrow band. And once I became an adult, I joined the military, became an adult, went to college, got married, had kids. All of a sudden, my world opened up to me and it was like, I know what you wanted, but this is what I want. And I'm way happier now. I, so, and isn't that what we want for our children? Happiness. How many people have I interviewed through the years that have said I was pushed into this, the expectation of that? And, and it's all about that inner child. It doesn't matter if they're 40, 50, 60, 70. It's that inner child that was never heard, never given a voice, uh, never even looked upon as what they wanted. And then suddenly at that grand age, they open up. I'm now doing what I want to do. 
and they could have been doing it all along the line and really been living a life very fulfilling instead of having to wait for careers to end, divorce, you know, a whole load of end of chapters because they followed the wrong path. And that's yeah. the important thing is we want our children to follow a path that is is going to fortify them along the way, that's going to give them the knowledge and the wisdom and allow them to expand and to grow. And if we don't do that, then we're the ones that are failing there. So, so many people I interview have always saying, if only I had when I was young, if only I was allowed to do this or allowed to do that. Um, I hated the career I went into. I hated this and that. And then, you know, I walked away from the six figure thing and went and did what I love anyway. So why do we have to take them along the hate path <laughs> to discover what they love? Why don't we look at what our child loves? And yes, they're going to they're going to want to be the fireman, the astronaut, the this, the that. They're going to want to be something different every day. But you're going to see a common denominator of something they're very good at. Right. And then you could put things in front of them that you know that that would help that grow and develop even further. And what they do with it is in just as much wonderment to you as it is to them. Well, in my four pillars approach, uh, you know, the very first thing is you have to give yourself permission. Mm -hmm. You really don't need permission from somebody else, no. but to give yourself permission, you do have to know yourself well enough. Yes. And then, and then to carve your path out, you have to be able to have a resonating voice, whether it's writing, projecting, uh, being a presence, being an innovator, being an inspirational person. You have to have your own unique voice, but you do have to identify the passion early enough. A century ago, F. Scott Fitzgerald said, and I, I'm American, so pardon the using an American quote, but <laughs> Americans have no second act. Mm. And what Americans are finding out in this century is that your second act is usually your most powerful act. It is. Yes. You don't, you, you don't realize because no one taught you, no one gave you permission to be yourself. Exactly. And if you're ever <laughs> given permission to be yourself, you're going to do everything until you get so sick and tired of it, but you do gain a level of afflu affluence so that you can go, I, I'm going to let this go. Yeah. I've denied myself permission for so long. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Oh, Oh, lost two decades. How can you lose two decades? Oh, I lost more than that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want, when I work with parents and I, I won't tell them point blank, understand the misery you went through trying to meet other people's expectations. <sighs> and then I'll have someone say, well, but I have to meet my boss's expectations every day. And I'll go, no, you don't. There's always a choice. You can always quit and go somewhere else. Yes. So yes. You are always co-creating your environment, whether you want to admit it or not. Mm. Now, would the pain of quitting if you don't have another job be a little bit unbearable, maybe? Yeah, it might hurt. You might not pay some bills. But at the end of the day, shouldn't you be doing something that, A, fits your psychological needs yeah. as well as your financial needs and allows you to be living that second act before you go through a horrible first act? You know, yes. yeah, I try to yeah. tell people it isn't about anything other than awareness. Yes, I want a 16 year old to be where I was when I was 46. Exactly. And I think today, when we look at our children, you know, we call them the kind of the indigo kids. They're born with such wisdom. They have such ability to actually understand. And they're very, very profound if we allow them to be. Right. Now, that doesn't mean they have all the answers, but very often they have an exquisite question that, <laughs> you know, opens up us to really think about what that answer should be. And I think this is, you know, the ability to ask the right question in itself is something that's, uh, that is, that we haven't asked. We didn't ask until too late. And I mean, for me, 57 starting this, right? So, and I was a people pleaser all my life and I never pleased anyone because I didn't please myself. So I wasn't being authentic. I wasn't but being me, right? No permission to be me. Had to be what everybody wanted me to be. What a waste of life. I wasted 50 something years in trying to fit into everybody else's box. I do not want that for my children or my grandchildren. I want them to explore. Are they going to fall down? Yes. For me, failure is when you choose not to get back up and, and you give in. But for me, every time you fall down and you get back up, it's a redirect. It's a yeah. pivot to another direction. Okay, that didn't work. What what would work now? Right? Yeah. The uh, 
the the lesson I give everybody is the 1960 Olympics. There was a uh, American runner. His name was John Mills. He was Indian. He was in he was indigenous tribe member, and he was running the marathon, and he won the marathon, but he didn't win the marathon from leading in the front. And as he entered the stadium, he literally fell down. Mm-hmm. And when he fell down, he got up, brushed himself off, and took off with re- renewed vigor and won the race. Mm-hmm. And when someone asked him, he said, the absolute best thing that could have happened to me was that I fell down. Because it allowed me to get back up and get my bearings. Ah, yes, yes. And so, you know, we're talking about a world-class ultra performer mm-hmm. here who has such a little nugget of wisdom. Mm-hmm. You know, I go all the way back to Socrates, probably one of the most wise people in the world. He didn't give you answers. No. He made you ask questions. Yes. And he is the original uh, originator of the modern concept of the five whys. When you ask a question, if you can still ask why at the end of the answer, you still haven't delved into it enough. Keep Mm -hmm. asking why until it brings you back to the original question. Mm -hmm. And that was the Socratic method in just a few words. Yes. We need our children and we more than ever need our parents to realize that children are not chess pieces. Mm -hmm. They are living beings who actually own this planet. We are simply the caregivers and the landlords. Mm -hmm. We need to take care of it because when we're gone, they're still going to be here and we better leave them with a competency and the ability to cope and b a world they can be proud of. And how can we do that if we make it in our our image, which is extremely flawed? Very flawed. Let's look at society as it is right now. Yeah. yeah, We need to allow them to evolve in their own way. I mean, I get so many nuggets from kids. They'll tell me, I don't know why I should ever listen to a politician. They never say anything that's of any value. Truth, truth, truth. And absolutely. They and, see the BS. <laughs> yeah. And, and they also say, well, how can I listen to my parent when all I hear them do is, you know, watch the news and then parrot the BS that I'm hearing on TV? Exactly. So, oh, you know, so, the parents are always unhappy because they're in an arena that they don't like. And they, you know, they come home with that angst. They come home with that displeasure. They come home with their misery and they pour it over on their children. And then, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not doing that. I'm doing this. Yes, you are. Kids pick up on your misery. They're your radar things. They pick up on everything, just like an animal. If an animal is in distress, it's because it's mimicking your distress. And so do children. They start playing up and you think they're being naughty. No, they're just picking up what's going on internally in you. And I think sometimes, depending on the level of the age of the child, it's better to say, I'm having a hard day. I'm having a hard day. I'm going through something right now. Can you help me? A hug will help empower them to feel that they can be a part of the healing and that whatever you're going through isn't to do with them because they will always think they've done something bad. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, this is one nugget that I would really want people to leave here with. Your child is not a distraction. Your child does not live to be a distraction. Your, Your child should be your main attraction. Mm-hmm. And you should understand that if they are doing something that gets your attention negatively, that probably means you weren't paying enough attention yes. to them in the first place. Yes. The average person as your parent only spends 37 minutes of quality time with each child a day worldwide. Mm-hmm. It's a horrible statistic. Horrible. We are so busy chasing our own world and our own living that we forget that these are people we brought into the world that we need to give care to. Mm-hmm. give care to them. And if they're acting up and you get angry about it, you need to go look in the mirror and take a few deep breaths and go, why did I let it get to this point? Because it wasn't them. It was you. Yeah. Indigenous tribes have a belief and not all of them, but the majority of them say when a child is born, it belongs to the village. It belongs mm-hmm. to the tribe. Mm-hmm. So if a child is having difficulties, it's up to the tribe to help. Now, did the parent maybe have a few problems or issues? You know what? That becomes a tribal issue, too. It takes a village to keep a village. It takes a village to raise a child. And all of that has to go hand in hand with one concept. You have one stinking job. Raise your child to be a fully functional adult who with hope, with love, with happiness and passion. Don't don't try to control them. Let them, if nothing else, let them control you, because at the end of the day, 
that might be the smartest decision you've made. Yes. Um, what we can discover about ourselves through the children discovering themselves is absolutely awesome. And I will admit that with grandchildren, it, it is more, I'm, I have more time to observe and be a part of that than I was as a mother that was mostly doing it alone. And I know the, how hard it is. And this is why we do need the village and we do need to ask for help. And we do need to, to you know, bring the neighbors in. Can you watch the kid? Well, I have a bath, you know, <laughs> simple things. And of course, we've got some great chapters on, on you know, a burnout as well and making sure that you are fortified because you've got to remember, kids are sponges. If you're in distress or unhappy, they're going to pick that up. So you need to, you know, nurture yourself as well and... <laughs> Be happy and joyful in your own life, doing something you love to do so that your children can get, oh, she loves what she's doing. So I want to find something I love what I'm doing as well, right? So they, you know, copy what we are. So let's be very conscious of what we're giving them. Your chapter is wonderful. You've got graphics in there as well. And I'm so happy you joined us in this book. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I'm very proud of this book and all the people that are in it. And uh, it is book one in this series and I encourage people to you can get it as an ebook you just go to the orchard of wisdom dot org org dot org and just go to our forgotten children and all of our authors there you can click on the the link there underneath the picture that goes to their own show page you can buy the book there and at the end of March we will have it out in audiobook and also we will then start with ask the author question platform where um, if you want to speak to one of the authors about their chapter about their expertise you can sign up that will be coming towards the end of March all you have to do is go to our forgotten children on Facebook group our forgotten children and all the announcements will be there as well as on um, the orchard of wisdom.org our forgotten children page and uh, you can sign up to ask an author the question after reading their chapter because you want to know more that will be a paid platform because we are a fundraiser all the money raised from this book goes to each of the authors organizations that they support and so it is a keep on giving book it gives you knowledge it gives you support it keeps uh, the wheels going on the people that are already supporting families and children and if we want to have a a more stronger, fruitful, happy society. Down the road, folks, we need to invest in our children today. And we haven't been doing it right. We need to change the system. And it's simply awareness. And that's what this book is about. Awareness, careness, let's change the platform. So thank you so much, buddy. And of course, if you go to his author's page, all of his books are there. Uh, all of the books that he's written, the, look, the links to how to get hold of him and everything. And uh, I encourage you to go and get his books as well and reach out to him and of course sign up for Ask the Author. You can drop it in the comments. I want to be a part of Ask the Author. Drop it in the comments with your email. I'll be in touch with you. So thank you so much, buddy. And thank you so much for being a part of this platform. Well, it not only was an honor, but a privilege to work with the other authors. And I I firmly believe that there's no such thing as a bad parent. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there may be outliers. We're going to ignore that. But there are no such thing as bad uh, parents. <clears throat> there are poorly prepared parents. Yes. They're or wounded all, parents. They're only going to yeah. do as good as they can. Yeah, based on what they know. But, yeah, and and our goal and our job is to get them to a higher plane. Exactly. Exactly. I appreciate your time, Sarah. I appreciate yours too. So folks, please get the book, Our Forgotten Children. It's right there on Amazon, ebook, paperback, audio coming, reader's chapter. Go and look at all his books that he's got out there. He is the parent guru. So if you need help along the way, I'm really not sure what I'm doing. I need just to know more than contact buddy. So until next time, folks, bye for now. We hope that you enjoyed the show. There are so many more for you here on selfdiscoverywisdom.com. Just go to the podcast tag at the top there and you will see all the many genres and all 3,000 shows ready for your listening. We are here to serve you, to help you on your journey of life. And we know that through inspiration, it begets invitation. We are supported by you, the listeners, and those that we interview. Anything that you can spare us in donation would be greatly accepted and we do hope that you enjoy the next show.